Kia ora. Robert McLaughlin here. Welcome to week 7 of 160.204, Differential Equations 1. This week we'll start a new unit, which is really going to uh, take us most of the way through the rest of the semester, looking at systems of ordinary differential equations. What do we mean by a system of ordinary differential equations? Well, they're, they're still ordinary differential equations, not partial. So that means there's just one independent variable, which mostly we're going to call t. But there's more than one dependent variable, which are going to end up being functions of t in the solution. So they could be called, for example, uh, x, y, z, and so on. Or if you wanted something a bit more systematic, you could call them x1, x2, x3, and so on, which is quite useful if you want to have a very large number, maybe an arbitrary number with a system with a thousand or a million moving parts. You would need a lot of variables, so we can use the index notation. But one thing makes it much easier, which is that we only need to consider first order systems, so just first derivatives. And the reason is that any higher order differential equation or any higher order system can always be rewritten as a first order system. So let's just, uh, it's a very simple trick, and then we'll just see how it works in an example. So we'll take uh, y double prime minus 4y prime plus 4y equals 0. I'm going to make a new dependent variable. Uh, it'll be u, and it's just defined to be equal to the first derivative of the other dependent variable, the old one. And in terms of these two variables, u and y, I can rewrite this as a first order system. Well, that means I'm going to need to know what is the derivative of y and what is the derivative of u. Well, the derivative of y, y prime, I see that that's got to be equal to u because that was just the definition of my new variable u. But what about u prime, the new variable? Well, u prime, differentiate both sides of this equation, u prime must be y double prime. But I know what y double prime is from the differential equation. It's 4y prime minus 4y. And I know what y prime is in terms of uh, my new variable. It's just u. So I get 4u minus 4y. So u prime is 4u minus 4y. Now notice that in the system on the left hand side, I've only got first derivatives. And on the right hand side, I've got no derivatives. So that's a very nice standard way to write a system. Now, when you have a couple system of uh, ordinary differential equations, you notice that you can't solve the y equation by itself because it depends on u. And you can't solve the u equation by itself because it depends on y. So it's like having two equations and two unknowns. They must be solved as a simultaneous system of two equations and two unknowns. Well, today we won't actually solve any of these systems. We'll just look at some examples of where they come from. So here's a flow model. So some, some salty water, some brine, and some tanks. We saw similar problems uh, way back in the first week of the course, but the twist now is that there are two tanks, and the flow is going in all directions there. So let's have a look at this. I need to um, work out what variables to choose to write this as a system of differential equations. If you look at this diagram for a while, you'll see that there's four liters a minute of fluid entering tank A, and also 4 litres a minute leaving tank A. So the total volume of fluid in tank A is always going to be 50 litres. Tank B also has 4 litres a minute leaving and 4 litres a minute entering, so it will also always have 50 litres of water. All that is changing is the amount of salt dissolved in it. So what I need to keep track of, the thing that's changing, is the mass of salt in each tank. So. In a problem like this, you always start by defining your variables. It's going to be the mass of salt in kilograms in tank A. And x2 is going to be the mass of salt in kilograms in tank B. And the volume of water is going to be always 50 litres in each tank. 
Now, how fast is salt moving around? I need to keep track of the rate of change of the amount of salt in tank A. So the rate of change of salt in tank A is going to be the rate in minus the rate out. How is salt entering tank A? Well, not on the left there, because this is just pure water. No, no salt in there. The only way that salt can be getting into tank A is from tank B. What rate is that? Well, the flow rate is one liter a minute. And what's the concentration of salt? It's going to be the mass of salt in tank 2 divided by the volume of water. And that is, uh, that's the rate of salt entering. Then I have the rate of salt leaving, which is from this arrow. And likewise, that's going to be 4 liters per minute times the concentration of salt in tank A, which is x1 over 50. Put them all together and I get uh, 0.02x2 minus 0.08x1. And the units there are kilograms per minute, which is exactly what I want. This one is in kilograms. I can do the same trick for tank 2. Tank two. Rate in minus rate out. Now some of those errors I've computed already, right? The salt entering is the circled one there, so that's going to be 0.08x1 minus how can salt leave? Well, some salt can leave from this arrow. I worked that one out already. But salt can also leave through this arrow, which is just going to be um, 3 times x2 over 50, so that's 0.06x2. So altogether it's 0.08x1 minus 0.08x2. I've got two equations in two unknowns. On the left hand side, I've got the first derivatives of my dependent variables, and on the right hand side, I've just got some function of x1 and x2. So I've formulated the system as a system of two differential equations. I'll also need um, the initial values to have an initial value problem. That would give me x1 at time 0, 25 kilograms initially x2 at time 0, 0. There's an initial value problem for a system of two first order ordinary differential equations. And the next one is going to be a system of three ordinary differential equations, again first order. It's called the SIR model of epidemics. It's a simple model, but it does describe a lot of real world epidemics very closely. So S, I, and R are going to be the proportion of the population. So they're all going to be um, numbers between 0 and 1. So if, if S was 0 0.5, that would mean 50% of the population was susceptible to getting infected. And in this simple model, you can only be in one state at one time, and you can only move from the susceptible population into the infectious model. So you might be sick or you might not be sick, but still infectious. And once you're infectious, all that can happen to you is you recover. So you could imagine more complicated models in which you had more possible states in which people could be. Now, what is the rate of change of all of these? How can you move from susceptible to infectious? Well, that should be proportional to the number of susceptible people, because if, you, if there are twice as many susceptible people, then the rate of them getting sick will double, and also proportional to the number of infectious people. So if we call the rate constant k, the rate of change of the susceptible fraction is going to be k times s times i, because it's proportional to s and it's also proportional to i, and I'm introducing a rate constant k, and the sign should be negative, because this is the rate at which people leave the susceptible box. No other arrows entering or leaving the S box there, so I move on to the I box. Um, rate in minus rate out. I have some people entering the infectious box. And then I have some people leaving because they're recovering. Let's call the rate, and again, 
the rate of people recovering is going to be proportional to the number of sick people because sick people, we're assuming that each person has an equal chance of recovering in every time interval. So the constant, ra constant uh, the rate constant is going to be m, and it's proportional to i. And then the rate of change of the number of recovered people is just um, rate in. You move into that box at rate m i. And you notice how these terms are pairing up. They represent the same arrow. What would be the initial condition? Well, if we wanted to study an epidemic, we could say it's just starting, which means there's a very small number of infectious people. So let's call that epsilon, some small number. And let's say there's no uh, recovered people yet. And that means the proportion of susceptible people must be 1 minus epsilon. If so, if epsilon was 0.01, you'd have 0.01 infectious and 99% susceptible. So just this simple model already captures a lot of the behavior of real-world epidemics. And I can start to draw con conclusions from this model. For example, uh, if I add up these three equations, Add up the left-hand sides, I get the time derivative of s plus i plus r. On the right, if I add up those three right-hand sides, you can see they cancel in pairs and I get zero. So that means the time derivative of the sum of the three variables is zero, which means it must be a constant. What constant is it? Well, it's initially one. That makes sense because everybody has, to, in our model, everybody has to be in one of the three boxes. The total population is always one. Now, there's a lot you could do with this model. You could study how the behavior, how the spread of the epidemic varies depending on the two parameters there, K and M. So I just did a little example in MATLAB. I solved the equations numerically. Here is a little function that I saved into uh, an M file called sir.m. That just gives the right-hand side of the differential equation and defines the parameters. And then I call that interactively by calling ODE45 to do a numerical solution of the differential equation. This is the initial and final time. So time is in days, so going from day 0 to day 150. This is the initial condition. And then I plot the three components of the solution, so I get three curves. And you notice that the one thing you might be interested from how your health system is performing is how many sick people are there at any given time. You see it increases rapidly at first, then it peaks around day 40, and then it starts to decline. And the most use of the model is when you're early on in this rapidly growing phase and you're trying to predict when will the uh, epidemic peak and how long will it take to decline. You can gather data on how the epidemic is spreading early on, estimate the parameters and make predictions. It, and there's one very interesting thing in the SIR model which is that the blue curve, the proportional proportion susceptible, it never reaches zero. So in this one it tends towards 0.2. So there's 20% of the population who never get sick at all. The, the disease has died out with no more infectious people before that last part of the population got sick.